world has come to a crossroads in modern history, if the world were to continue along the pathway currently chosen by my government and some others, civilization will be plunged for as long as a generation or more into a global dark age uh, comparable to that which struck Europe seven and a half centuries ago. We must not pretend that that danger does not exist. We must commit ourselves to the hopeful alternative which wise governments would prefer. Therefore, I should speak frankly but optimistically of a second crossroad, the Middle East. For as far back in history as we know, as civilization reaches, long before the strategic crossroads of Eurasia, uh, of the Discovery War, the Middle East has been the crossroads of Eurasia and Africa combined, as it is today. With or without petroleum, the historic strategic significance of the Middle East to itself and to the world will continue. Given the desperate situation of the world today, we cannot be so naive as to presume that powers which may be great, or even simply powerful, will react sanely to the relevant strategic facts of the situation. Zoom in as if from an orbiting space station upon the present and present ecology of this region of the world's biosphere. In our imagination, let us watch the long-range historical process of the melting of the great Eurasian glacier over the interval, interval from about 19,000 years ago, when ocean levels were approximately 400 feet below the present, close to today. Watch the evolution of the Mediterranean region over the following millennia. Watch the later phase of the great desiccation of the once rich desert regions of Sahara, the Gulf, and Central Asia. From the standpoint of that lapsed time panorama, we are reminded in the most useful way of a fact we already know, that the most critical of the strategic economic factors inside the Middle East region as a whole is not petroleum, but fresh water. Greetings to all of you from the many different countries, from wherever you may be listening now. We are organizing this OASIS conference to inject a perspective of hope and show a way out of an otherwise desperate, extremely dangerous and indeed catastrophic situation in Southwest Asia. If we don't replace this present escalation, which could rapidly turn into a full-fledged regional war, turning into a global nuclear war, it could mean the end of the human species on this planet. In order to avoid that the short-term danger, what is needed is a co cognitive jump to conceptualize an entirely different approach, namely to define the economic and security self-interest of the Palestinians, the Arabs, in general, as well as the Israelis, and then the neighboring countries in the larger region. Why am I saying this? <clears throat> what has happened in the last six months is unprecedented in all of history. A genocide which is happening in real time is transmitted live from the battlefield in Gaza to the TV sets in the living rooms of the world audience. So while in the first instance after the Hamas attack October 7th on Israeli villages causing 1,200 deaths, the sympathy of much of the world was with Israel. That changed day by day, week by week, month by month. Billions of people could watch with their own eyes, unfiltered by commentators and narrative authors. And what they saw was not a measured counter-reaction by a country under attack, but a relentless ethnic cleansing in a sealed, tiny territory by one of the most highly technologically equipped military forces in the world, using artificial intelligence for targeting of Hamas fighters, and at the same time denying water, food, medical care, electricity, housing, clothing, sanitation, etc., to an entirely unarmed population. 
So far, the casualties of the Palestinian side are around 33,400, of which 17,000 are children. That is 44% of all killed are children. And more than 1 million are starving to death acutely. That is why there have been hundreds of thousands in the streets in Islamic countries, in American and European cities, and in the universities. In the aftermath of the Israeli attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, US CENTCOM commander General Michael Gorilla is presently visiting Israel, where he met with IDF chief of staff Herzi Halevi and Defense Minister Galant and visited Air Force command centers as well as the air bases. Western media is buzzing about a possible Iranian strike on a variety of targets in Israel. It's clearly a hair trigger situation, which in the worst case could turn into a regional and even global war. Despite this escalation, and all the more because of it, it is therefore of the utmost urgency that a completely different approach is being introduced, namely the so-called OASIS plan, which was proposed in 1975 by my late husband, Lyndon LaRouche. It is based on the idea to create an incentive for both the Palestinians and the Israelis to replace the present feelings of deep injury, pain and despair for some and hatred for others with a perspective of a common economic development for the creation of a better future for all generations to come. For the Palestinians, it is of vital importance for their existence. And for the Israelis, they should listen to those who are warning them about the change in the perception of the world, such as Ami Ayalon, the former director of the Shin Bet during the time of the Oslo Accords. In an article in the current issue of Foreign Affairs, he warns Israel that following the IDF attack on food trucks on February 29th, killing 112 people and wounding 760 who were desperately trying to obtain the food that could save them from starvation, and the attack on the seven world central kitchen workers eradicated the legitimacy of the war in the eyes of the world. That it is seen no longer as a war of self-defense, but an, as an act of expansionist aggression. Furthermore, <clears throat> Ayalon writes that Israel cannot win by eliminating the Hamas leadership, since that would not make the Hamas ideology disappear. That is an understatement of the year. Even if the present crisis would not lead to a global annihilation of the entire human species, in which obviously also Israel would vanish, if the cycle of violence is not interrupted once and for all, the future for all will be a hell in which one war will follow the next, as we have seen during the last 75 years, always naturally feeding the various arm producers of the growing military industrial complexes. What we propose therefore is the updated version of the OASIS plan first introduced by Lyndon LaRouche in 1975, which he proposed after attending a celebration of the Ba'ath Party in Iraq, attended by many leaders of the non-aligned movement. For anyone visiting Southwest Asia, the most striking experience is the overwhelming presence of the desert, the obvious shortage of water, especially fresh water. It is also clear that the requirements for the water consumption of any population, Israeli or Arab, for a modern living standard cannot be satisfied from the existing natural water resources. Furthermore, in all of the military conflicts so far, the lack of water and the efforts to control the access to water played a decisive role. The existing aquifers in the region do not provide even approximately sufficient water. Therefore, even a fair sharing agreement would not solve the problem. In order to create large amounts of fresh water, new water, 
a variety of methods must be deployed. The most obvious to begin with are several canals connecting the Mediterranean with the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea with the Red Sea. Because of the difference in altitude, the Dead Sea is about 400 meters below the Mediterranean. This allows for hydropower generation. But if one creates an additional canal from the Gulf of Aqaba to the Dead Sea, the basic idea is to increase the size of the canals sufficiently to allow for large scale desalinization projects along the banks of the canals with the aid of a number of nuclear power plants. Even if the cost of producing fresh water from desalination of salt water with nuclear energy is relatively high, the economic benefit from the enormous economic activity generated this way in areas where there was absolutely none before is orders of magnitude larger than the amount originally spent. It is the unique power of human labor that with the help of science and technology, it adds value to the process so that the outcome of work is always higher in terms of value than all the elements which went into it. The energy flux density used in this determines the ratio of the added value. So it really pays for itself. In order to conceptualize a vision of development for the entire region, from India to the Mediterranean, from the Caucasus to the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, and how that area can develop as a future hub between Asia, Africa and Europe, one should imagine the infrastructure density, for example, of Germany, where you have an integrated system of highways, railways, water systems, which represent the precondition for advanced industrial development and agriculture. There is no objective reason why Southwest Asia cannot achieve a comparable level in the future. If the looming war can be avoided, the tectonic change which is taking place in the world today, where the countries of the Global South are already working to create a new economic system, can create the conditions for the full development of Southwest Asia. Russia, China, India, Iran, the United Emirates and Egypt are already members of the BRICS. Saudi Arabia is a candidate. Others like Turkey have indicated an intent to join. If all these countries would agree to develop the, uh, to the development perspective of the OASIS plan and convene a comprehensive Southwest Asia conference on an emergency basis in the tradition of the Peace of Westphalia, the present looming catastrophe can be avoided and the crisis turned into the beginning of a new era of peace and development. Henry Kissinger, who pretended to be an expert on the Westphalian order, actually crossly misunderstood it by insisting that it requires a balancing power, namely an unipolar policeman. He claimed that the Westphalian system never applied fully to the Middle East, since only Turkey, Egypt and Iran had a historical basis, while the borders of the other states would reflect the arbitrariness of the victors of World War I. He obviously was referring to the intent for future manipulations of the Sykes-Picot Treaty. That is why the world must return to the actual peace of Westphalia and establish a new international security and development architecture, which takes into account the interest of every single country on the planet. That new architecture must emphatically include Russia, China, the US, as well as a two-state solution for Israel and Palestine. According to the cost of war project of the Watson Institute at the Brown University in Rhode Island, in the 20 years from 9-11 in 2001 until 2021, the US military expenditures included collateral costs where, including collateral costs were $8 trillion, which was spent for military and counterterrorism measures in 85 countries 
not including U.S. Special Operation Forces, CIA operations, military information, support operations, psychological operations, etc. In the same period, more than 940,000 people have been killed by direct war violence in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Pakistan, and the number of civilians who have died as a result of indirect causes is significantly higher. If that amount of money, $8 trillion, would have been invested in programs to overcome poverty and underdevelopment, the world would be today a prosperous garden and the United States would be a celebrated friend of humanity. I can already hear the critics who say that this perspective of an OASIS plan as the starting point for a new international security and development architecture in the spirit of the Encyclica Populorum Progressio of Paul, Pope Paul VI is not realistic, or even worse, completely utopian. When Friedrich Schiller wrote his trilogy Wallenstein about the powerful warlord of the Thirty Years' War, he portrayed Wallenstein not in the way the handed down historic interpretation characterized him, but as a man who really wanted to end the war and reach peace. In the play, Schiller puts the vision of the Peace of Westphalia, which was reached 16 years later in the mouth of Max Piccolomini, the fiancé of Wallenstein's daughter Tekla. In a conversation with his father and a representative of the Vienna court, Questenberg, Max says, you make him, Wallenstein, an indignant man, and God knows to what even more because he spares the Saxons, seeks to inspire confidence in the enemy, which is the only way to peace. For if war does not end in war, where then shall peace come from? That is the whole idea. For if war does not end in war, where then shall peace come from? To inspire confidence in the enemy, that is the only way to peace. At the abyss of what could become the end of all life on the planet, are we, mankind, the creative species, and can we define a solution out of this danger? So let us put the OASIS plan on the table of all governments of the world. This is a, an international podium where global messages uh, should be addressed to the world, uh, especially, you know, with the Schiller Institute's plan, the OASIS plan that has great resonance in terms of economic development globally. But before, you know, we talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the OASIS plan, I would like to highlight the apex of this protracted conflict that has been going on for the last 75 years between Palestinians and Israelis. Now, I don't want to go into the history of this conflict as much as to highlight what is going on today uh, around us. Today, there is a war that has been declared by Israel on the entire Palestinian people with the intention of decimating them, with the intention of forcefully diasporizing them again, with the intention of controlling the geography of Palestine and getting rid of the demography of Palestine. What we are witnessing today, a war of ethnic cleansing, a genocide, a murder, butchery. The excuse of October 7 has showed explicitly the intentions of Israel. It's not only pursuing Hamas, but destroying the infrastructure of Gaza, destroying the Palestinian people in Gaza, in East Jerusalem, and let alone the West Bank. Where are we going from here? So far, we have seen that Israel has failed, has failed, and I say has failed 
dismally in fulfilling its objectives. It cannot get rid of Hamas. It cannot get rid of 2 million Palestinians who are now starving to death in Gaza. It cannot get rid of the Palestinian quest for independence and quest for self-determination because the reality has shown that Palestinians will never kneel down and will never accept diasporization as they did in 1948. Saying this, because time is very limited and I don't want to continue describing, but I would like to forecast what could be done to get basically two countries neighboring each other to live in peace. I would say that the Palestinian people, even under occupation, have practiced the highest form of democracy. We had democratic elections, legislative, presidential, municipal, and what have you. We have built our civil society. We have created linkages between our society, civil society, and that of our government. And we have uh, built basically the freedom of speech and expression. And we tried to also uh, build our economic system, yet uh, being under, I mean, totally uh, uh, submitted, submissive, basically, to that of the Israeli economy. Uh, but still, you know, we managed to look at the options and resources of how we can create a sustainable economic production. Of course, you know, the uh, lack of water aquifers, the shortages of water in the West Bank, because the settlers use most of it and their control of the water aquifers uh, basically restricts the production of uh, our agriculture products. And that in itself creates, you know, a certain kind of an impediment towards progress and development as far as economy is concerned. But we cannot really economically develop when we are totally subservient to that of the Israeli occupation and to their economy and their control over our natural resources, yet alone also our human resources. And that's why, you know, when we talk about peace, there will never be peace before a political resolution to this conflict. There is no economic solution without a political solution to this protracted conflict that has been uh, fought between two epistemic communities for the last eight decades now. And that's why this makes me uh, more uh, inclined to talk about, you know, prospects of peace. Continuing uh, uh, talking about water and UNESCO, uh, I would like to just express one thing because it is uh, always uh, between the lines. And as uh, Professor Hassassian mentioned, uh, the Israeli regime is a theocratic regime. And they try to convince everybody that the conflict between Israel and Palestine is a religious conflict, which is, which is completely false. Our conflict is not a religious conflict. Is It is a political conflict. It is a legal conflict, not religious at all. It is just between brackets. With this, now I will turn to uh, the question of water in UNESCO. At UNESCO, we have uh, a program called Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, IHP. Uh, it was founded in 1975. Following, in, following the decade uh, of uh, hydrology, uh, uh, 1965 to 1974. So the Intergovernmental Cooperation Program, uh, it is the lonely one international uh, and intergovernmental cooperation uh, program uh, in the UN system. It is at UNESCO. Uh, beside this, the, it has a, an intergovernmental council that meets uh, every year, and the purpose, it is uh, the cooperation between member states uh, within the uh, question of water, aquifers, and everything, uh, of course. 
and uh, there is what we call the uh, World Water Forum. The next one, it is the 10th World Water Forum. It will take place in Bali, in Indonesia, uh, next May, uh, end of May. I don't have the uh, exact dates in, the, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in mind. Well, so this means that UNESCO is in charge also uh, of the cooperation around water, which is uh, the, uh, the main principle uh, in the OASIS uh, plan. Uh, the question of, uh, of water now, if we relate it to the ongoing uh, genocidal war uh, of Israel on Gaza, uh, everybody can recognize clearly that Israel is using water as a weapon. This is what we call weaponization uh, of water. And uh, this uh, should be uh, denounced and condemned by the international community. And unfortunately, uh, the international community is watching passively in this regard, which makes it complicit. Uh, it has been mentioned that uh, many countries are complicit in this conflict because they are providing weapons, just like the, U the US. This is active complicity, but there is the passive complicity, those who do not condemn and who do, do not uh, apply any pressure on Israel, the occupying power, to stop weaponization uh, of water in the ongoing uh, conflict. Esteemed delegates, distinguished guests, as we gather here today at the international conference organized by the Schiller Institute, I am honored to address you on behalf of the Republic of South Africa. This occasion, which coincides with significant milestones in our nation's history, prompts us to reflect on the journey we have traversed, the challenges we have overcome, and the path we envision for the future. 30 years ago, on the 27th of April, 1994, South Africa celebrated a momentous occasion, the first democratic elections. This pivotal moment marked the culmination of a long and arduous struggle against apartheid, a struggle fueled by the unwavering commitment of our people to justice, equality, and freedom. As we commemorate three decades of democracy, it is imperative that we impart the lessons of our past to the younger generation, inspiring them to safeguard our hard-won liberties and to remain vigilant against any threat to our democratic values. The theme of this conference, development as the necessary framework for peace, resonates deeply with the journey of South Africa. Our experience underscores the intrinsic link between development and peace, recognizing that sustainable peace can only flourish in societies where development is nurtured and inclusive growth is fostered. Moreover, as we reflect on the words of Nelson Mandela, we are reminded of the fundamental aspirations shared by all humanity, the desire for safety, livelihood, health and education. It is incumbent upon us as the global citizens to work tirelessly towards realizing these aspirations for all. As we navigate the complexities of the contemporary world, marked by conflicts and crises, we are reminded of the imperative to unite in pursuit of peace. From Gaza to Ukraine and beyond, the quest for peace knows no borders and requires collective action rooted in dialogue, empathy and understanding. It is incumbent upon us to champion the cause of peace, to advocate for diplomacy over discord and to build bridges of cooperation that transcend ideological divides. Let us reaffirm our commitment to the noble ideals of peace development and global harmony. Let us draw inspiration from the resilience of our forebears and the aspirations of future generations. Together, let us forge a better world, one where justice reigns, 
prosperity abounds and peace prevails. We are meeting at a time when our our world has never been so close to a terrible disaster of nuclear conflict that can liquidate the whole world. At the same time, I think that we are we are meeting here too when they are the contours and of great possibilities have developed on the international horizons that can take our people out of out of poverty and into a into a period of uh development and peace. Um the 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 dangers that exist in the world are obvious. The two main uh, issues on our agenda today it's the Israel attacks on the Palestinians in the Gaza and the West Bank and possibly everywhere. And uh, and two, the second proxy war, that the second danger in the proxy war that is being waged against Russia with Ukraine being used as that proxy. This is a particularly dangerous situation because since NATO has in its ranks three nuclear powers and Russia itself is a powerful nuclear power as well. Just remember too that just before the the Russian special military operation that there was an issue that in which we could have had peace and this war was totally unnecessary but we had the indecency of the betrayal of the the of Russia the deception by Germany and France, who had guaranteed the Minsk Accord, and but only said that they had done that only to give time for NATO's troops or NATO's Ukraine to build up itself as a NATO power. This kind of mentality, too, explains the U.S. attitude towards China, because if you pursue every single policy, uh, statement, or line, or action by the Chinese government, you will see that China has never threatened anyone, never threatened the United States or anything. But because since, particularly since the end of 2008, after the financial crisis and, and China emerged as such a powerful economic player in the international scene, China has now been identified as a danger to that uh, that that plan of total domination um we, all of this too has led to another factor that countries are beginning to take other actions to to try to counter some of the measures those countries that regard have some strong regard for their sovereignty have been taking actions to prevent their their domination and this is where there were discussions today on the Oasis plan, which was a very, which was a plan uh, of with a lot of foresight that came about at a time uh, long before the, the the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, but which was was very uh, had a, had great thinking behind it, and and some of those some of some of the in, elements in those plans are now are today in some of the plans that are being put forward as an alternative to the unipolar world. And that has come about because the, the BRICS is offering some hope because the idea, as was mentioned here just before, um, by this, many of the speakers who came before me, that there is a direct link between economic and social progress and between and world peace and development, peace peace generally, and development. But we cannot have these plans without peace. That is why I say that peace is probably the most important thing. But for a sustained peace, we have to have social and economic progress, which the BRICS countries have been offering us. I want to thank uh, actually both of you, both uh, ambassadors of Palestine, uh, for sharing your deep felt um, experiences with us, which I think the world needs to know. I just would like to um, basically make the point that I think you mentioned the need to have a political solution first. 
And that is exactly what the OASIS plan is uh, trying to put on a different level because all the debates in the United Nations and other fora which demanded the political solution first did not accomplish what was uh, intended. And it is our view that we have to have an absolute ironclad commitment to an economic development plan as the precondition to move the political situation. Now, when the uh, Oslo Accord was uh, signed, uh, Lyndon LaRouche, my husband, uh, was emphatically saying that the only way how it could succeed would be to put shovels in the ground to immediately start earth moving machines you know, so that the people on the ground would see that there is an improvement of their immediate life uh, situation. And that was not done because at that point the World Bank denied the kind of credit which would have been necessary. And as we all know, the Oslo Accord did not succeed. So uh, since the whole purpose of this conference is to put together, and especially you know when we hear the other speakers in the second panel, we want to put together a very concrete sort of bunch of economic flowers, you know, development project flowers, to then take the result of this conference to go to all governments of the world and other institutions to basically, you know, try to get the kind of support, because I personally think that the only way how we will be able to implement that is if we get an emergency conference, a comprehensive Mideast conference, as it was, for example, mentioned early on by, by China. Um, to my knowledge, unfortunately, they did not concretize it uh, very much since. But it is still the idea that you have to have a comprehensive Mideast conference. And I think the tradition of the Peace of Westphalia is the most suitable uh, precedence. And then discuss you know, what would be the vision for all of the region because I think you, ha you have to break the cycle of violence and despair. And if there would be a vision how Southwest Asia could look like in 20, 50, even 100 years, being a fully developed modern area with uh, green uh, forests and agricultural fields where now there is desert, new cities, uh, integrated infrastructure, and then have the vision that all the young people should become scientists, engineers, teachers, farmers, um, that they would see a reason why it would, would make sense to study, to have a family, to, to build their careers, to have a normal life. I think to inject that sense of hope in the young people is almost the precondition for this project to succeed. So I think the vision of economic improvement is an absolutely uh, essential ingredients for getting peace and finding a political solution. And I would like to thank you very much for your participation. And uh, I hope you would help us to continue this organizing for this project, even beyond this conference. Can I make a simple contribution before I leave? Yes. Just a reaction to Madame LaRouche's, uh, of course, eloquent presentation and ideas. Thank you so much for your concern about our conflict, because as you know, the fulcrum of instability in the Middle East lies in the solution of the Palestinian problem. I can understand par excellence the economic development, how it could be cataclysmic in its effect to a negotiated process between two countries that are legitimately mutually respect each other and try to find a plausible solution for sustaining peace and that longevity of peace is based on economic integration and development. That cannot be underestimated, but we cannot really come to talk about economic development with, uh, uh, with two uh, negotiators, let's say, two countries, one is the top dog and the other one is the underdog. So we cannot have negotiations between occupier and occupied and talk about economic development. Economic de development could be a catalyst to improve an ongoing 
negotiations that is based on mutual reciprocity and respect. When there is no dignified respect between two contending parties, then the results will be a dismal failure. And of course, I want to add one simple sentence that I always do. There will be never a military solution to our conflict. Israel has won so many wars, but could not bring peace and security, neither to Israel nor to the Middle East. So what I say, the only way out is negotiations, mutual respect, inclusivity, and not exclusivity, and the idea of accepting each other on an equal footing is the only way to progress towards peace and security. Thank you so much for inviting me again. I wanted to conclude with some positive remarks that war will never, will never bring peace. Peace will bring stability and economic prosperity. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much also. Thank you, Madam. So where is to start? If I uh, mention about where to start, I think we are, let's talk about the United States because I mentioned just now about, about Truman involvement. President Clinton has made over 175 telephone calls to a head of state in direct support of the Middle East peace process with a six visit uh, to the region. And the president also hosts a number of meetings and summits in the United States. For example, the, uh, the uh, Israel Syria talk at uh, Severstone in 1919. The We River meeting in 98 and 95 Washington summit, 94 signing the Washington Declaration by Israel and Jordan. And this is very uh, significant things because it's ended the war and the, the signing declaration of principle 1993 for the historical handshake between Prime Minister Rabin and Chairman Arafat. So now we are talking about Indonesia position. Indonesia defense uh, of Palestine from Israeli colonialism is, I think, the only one in the in the in the world, you know, is implemented on the preamble to the 1945 constitution that we have. In essence, it condemns all forms of colonialism and it's committed to bringing peace and continuing the support of uh, Sukarno of uh, firm states. Therefore, Indonesia needs to be ready in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this point. I think Indonesia needs to be ready politically, militarily, diplomatically, and the last one is financially. Because Indonesia, doesn't have the capability to project the military power that far to that area, not to mention that we are embarrassingly outgunned. So centrality of the Palestinian cause versus the action of individual countries. I think the leading Islamic power set, uh, set out to achieve the, uh, the semblance of United Front or the vital issue of the Palestine, but it's only managed to reinforce prevailing division. The important point is to note that while the joint statement has argued to centrality of the Palestinian causes as the proper condition to regional peace and stability, but the action and individual countries reveal the national and geostrategic interests, not the Palestinian cause. Finally, the character of the ultimately make all the difference we have seen throughout human history that nation rise, develop, thrive, gain strength, overcome great challenges is actually with the strength of their character not necessarily with their material stockpile. So unfortunately, Al Jazeera once uh, you know, stated that most Muslim countries are ruled by corrupt, autocratic, despotic, or worse, maybe no good rules. Hoping Indonesia will do something significant because we are one of the biggest Muslim countries in the world, I think we'll face a long and step, a steep road domestically. So what Indonesia can do actually, in my opinion, is first encourage the UN to take the source of the problem, how to make England and France to sit down and seriously think about the solution because whatever it is, they are both countries that will start it. So it doesn't concentrate on Islamic countries and the Southwest countries themselves, but on the two former colonialists and the biggest root causes of this war. So I think the biggest homework that we have is how to overcoming nervousness that the UN uh, on the issue of the confidence building strategy to UN, uh, you know, to do something uh, to the uh, France and the British. I think uh, that is my point. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the leadership of the International Schiller Institute for convening this important and uh, timely conference. I appreciate the professional 
uh, profound, nuanced, and sober presentations of the distinguished speakers on the issues which are on top of the agenda of world policymakers and which define the future world order. I fully agree with the statement of the conference uh, organizers that it falls to us to ensure that every life in the world is sacred, that international law must prevail to prevent genocide, and that economic development must be the engine for peace. We in Belarus adhere to the same approach. I am pleased and honored to have this opportunity to present the vision of Belarus on the topic of our today's panel, Dialogue, Security, Peace and Development, with a special focus on Southwest Asia. We all understand that the emerging multipolar and a fairer world order is categorically unacceptable for the collective West, which is trying to maintain its political, financial, and economic dominance by any means and at any cost. Belarus has long been known as a net donor of peace, security, and stability in the region. The international community has viewed Belarus as a mainstay of regional security. We were the first ever to unilaterally forego the possession of nuclear weapons. We were among the first to implement the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe. We suggested integration of integrations in the post-Soviet space and beyond. Well known are our initiatives like creating a nuclear weapon free space in Central and Eastern Europe, recognizing diversity of uh, states' path of development, establishing a Helsinki II dialogue, developing the digital neighborliness belt, and to name the few. Everyone knows about Minsk agreement that helped to avoid massive human casualties in eastern Ukraine between 2015 and 2022, and was the only Operation started in Ukraine in 2022. Belarus initiated and hosted three rounds of talks on Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine. The draft agreement was initialed by the parties. Russia then made significant concessions, but someone in the West did not want peace in Ukraine and wanted the war until the last Ukrainian. So after the first round in Istanbul, the talks stopped altogether. Belarus could play the role of a third party in the resolution of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, said the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, recently. Just this Thursday, my president pledged readiness to help in case of negotiations between Moscow and Kiev. Neither the Ukrainians nor the West need to aggravate relations with Belarus. Having a third party always comes in handy in a situation when two states, or one nation in fact, have been pitted against each other. In this case, it looks like both Russia and Ukraine will need a peace-loving, calm, predictable Belarus. Uh, we maintain uh, a strong state based on the unity and patriotism of the people, the commitment of the Belarusians to peaceful evolutionary development and categorical rejection of destructive color revolutions. The last attempt by the West to stage a color revolution in Belarus in 2020 did not succeed, and we have since taken exhaustive measures to make sure that it will never be repeated. We fight information war waged against us with truth. We launched a nationwide comprehensive investigation into the crimes of genocide committed against the people of Belarus by the Nazi Germany and its collaborators. Raises its ugly head in Belarus again. We made a strategic choice. It will not be possible to tear our normal dialogue with interests of both sides. Belarus is ready to restore dialogue with the West and to jointly seek ways out of the current situation. We call on our Western partners to realistically assess the current state of affairs and deeply rethink everything. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to uh, thank uh, Shirley Institute and uh, Dr. Helga Roche for inviting me to this very interesting meeting. Uh, 
Uh, although mm, uh, I spent most of my diplomatic career in East Asia and been uh, doing uh, a United Nations job and BRICS uh, in, in my latest years, uh, still the question of Middle East and the question of uh, the conflict there is uh, well known and uh, interesting to all the uh, scholars of international relations. Uh, in fact, I remember when I was a schoolboy uh, more than 60 years ago, almost 60 years ago, uh, one of uh, the reports I was suggested to do at the geography lessons, we had good education in the Soviet Union, so everybody prepared some kind of uh, reports on the countries and territories. So I started this report um, with the words that uh, Lebanon has a very favorable geographical and climatic uh, location. And the teacher, who was very strict, and I mostly uh, got excellent marks at the time, said, no, uh, you are, you, I'll give you unsatisfactory mark. I said, why? Because... Lebanon is located next to Israel, and that's the place where there'll be always uh, some conflict and war. But I said, dear teacher, well, uh, political conflicts and wars, uh, these are things which are temporary, while geographical location is permanent. And he said, no, this is permanent as well. Is there any possibility to find some new approaches, to find some new solutions, maybe in the new paradigm of a, a world order which is based on sovereignty and on uh, the uh, consideration of interests of all the countries and parties. This is what BRICS promotes. Uh, mind you that uh, now we have uh, two countries of the region, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, involved in BRICS activities. So maybe uh, this conflict should be paid to more attention by the BRICS. Uh, because I, in general, support uh, the, uh, uh, the theory of the Schiller Institute that peace, uh, that the uh, development and prosperity are the basis for long-standing peace. Although you cannot reach those without the peace. So what comes first? But anyway, without uh, uh, future development, sustainable development, I don't think that any kind of peace deal would be long-term and uh, permanent. Is it possible to create some kind of a BRICS uh, rented uh, territory in Gaza Strip, which would be rented or for 100 years or whatever, or, or mm, given uh, uh, in... Uh, in in uh, uh, governance for some uh, period of time to BRICS countries, with, for example, Saudi Arabia and Egypt being the operators of this project, then we can find an answer how the OASIS plan could be financed. Because uh, BRICS uh, New Development Bank uh, may take a lead in infrastructure development. And the uh, uh, Gaza Strip would, would be governed internal affairs by the locally elected government, well, say Hamas, because Hamas was elected, and, uh, but the issues of foreign policy and security would be uh, on the responsibility of the BRICS. So that would put an end to the uh, Israel um, Israel, uh, Gaza, uh, Palestinian uh, direct contact. There will be no direct contact, in fact, because in this case, most of the finance, technology, and foreign trade would be, would come through the sea, uh, and maybe by uh, land through Egypt. And in this case, uh, this territory may develop in a very fast manner. Well, after all, look, uh, look nearby. Tel Aviv, 100 years ago, was just a desert. You know, now we see a Boston city. So, well, why not the same in, in, in Gaza, for example? But the issue of financing 
and uh, the uh, resources for development are as important as the concept of development itself. Now, I have the honor to uh, introduce to you a number of knowledgeable experts to show a way to create an entirely new Southwest Asia by building the basic economic infrastructure, beginning with large scale freshwater resources, energy production, transportation systems as a backbone for building modern agriculture, manufacturing, housing, healthcare, education, and all other relevant facilities that we need in a modern and dignified life. LaRouche put this perspective into practice. In composing the book, There Are No Limits to Growth, which was a response to the Club of Rome's publication called the limits to growth. The Club of Rome had said that essentially, no matter what we do, humanity was doomed because we would either run out of resources, we would be overwhelmed by pollution, or we would be overcome by huge teeming masses of human beings with nowhere to live. The solution that the Club of Rome put forward was to reduce growth rates, reduce population, reduce living standards to sort of put off that inevitable calamity. LaRouche said, forget it, this is the wrong approach. The limits to growth are those that we impose upon ourselves. The limits that mankind faces are, in some sense, laws of nature, but also the limitations of our imperfect knowledge of those laws of nature. We create resources. Animals use resources, we use resources, we create resources. We're fundamentally different. And that conception between human beings and nature is, it's totally upside down in people's approach to ecology and related matters today. There is an axiomatic assumption that if we do it, it's wrong. That using our abilities to transform nature is somewhat of a sin, and that nature were better left alone without our intervention. Here is a short video clip from Lyndon LaRouche commenting on this outlook. We have to get rid of all these characters, the green, all people greenies who say they're scientists must be expelled from the profession yeah. because they're committing a fraud. Any greenie who says he's a scientist is by per se committing a fraud by his mere existence. Because we know that we have a basis of science that has to include human development. So if you've excluded that or said that's an evil thing, then you can't be a scientist. No, you're not. You're a faker. Yeah. <laughs> if you believe yeah. in the green policy, you're a faker as, as a scientist. Yeah. Anybody who believes in the green policy is a faker. If they claim to have scientific capabilities. If they want to say they're stupid, we'll say, they're fine, now you, you are stupid, that's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the distinction of the human species is expressed very clearly by the Greek story of Prometheus the Firebringer, whose story is told by Aeschylus in a trilogy of plays that he wrote, of which only the first now survives. In that first play, Aeschylus talks about how Prometheus brought fire from heaven and gave it to humanity, and what else Prometheus did in creating the human species distinct from the animals. Prometheus says, Still, listen to the miseries that beset mankind how they were witless before, and I made them have sense and endowed them with reason. I will not speak to upbraid mankind, but to set forth the friendly purpose that inspired my blessing. First of all, though they had eyes to see, they saw to no avail. They had ears, but they did not understand. But just as those shapes and dreams throughout their length of days, without purpose, they wrought all things in confusion. They had no sign either of winter or of flowery spring or of fruitful summer on which they could depend, but managed everything without judgment until I taught them to discern the risings of the stars and their settings, which are difficult to distinguish. Yes, and numbers too chiefest of sciences, I invented for them, and the combining of letters, creative mother of the muses' arts, with which to hold all things in memory. I too first brought brute beasts beneath the yoke, to be subject to the collar and the pack saddle. He, his view, Prometheus explains, is that 
through his gift of fire, through his gift of knowledge, he transformed what humanity was capable of. So let's turn to Southwest Asia now. Here you see a map of Israel and Palestine. I think you'll be able to notice that Gaza and the West Bank, compared with the Israeli-administered territories right next to them, don't look as green. And that's not your imagination. Water and the shortage of water is a tremendous force in this area. If we look at water consumption per person, we see an enormous disparity between Israelis who individually have access to 247 liters of water per person. This statistically includes the West Bank settlers. And then we look at West Bank Palestinians, 82.4 liters. West Bank Palestinians that are not connected to the water grid, 26. This is far below the recommended minimum of the World Health Organization. How can you have a two-state solution if a state is not viable for lack of water? If we look at the level of natural so-called water available to people, we can see among countries in the region that Turkey, Iraq, um, Lebanon, the first three countries from the left, have what's considered to be sufficient water by global authorities. The next two in the middle, Syria and Egypt, are only about twice what's considered to be a critical level of water supply per person. If we really zoom in on the bottom, you can see Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority having below or even far below the level of water that is required. So what can be done? What can be done to make this region, which is starved of water, one that can become a, a land of abundance, a breadbasket? And how does it change the politics? The worry that Israel would have is that these rivers would be dammed up, that the water would never reach the Sea of Galilee that it could then not enter Israel's national water carrier, its water grid that takes water from the Sea of Galilee to supply Israel. So the Golan Heights issue, it's not only a political issue. This isn't just about altitude and missiles being launched from a certain area. This is also about water. How would the resolution of the Golan territorial dispute be eased if there wasn't such a tremendous risk from Israel's point of view, of losing access to water without the Golan Heights. This is a proposal for the route from the Red Sea up to the Dead Sea. So we're seeing in yellow, we're focusing on the nation, the kingdom of Jordan. And if we follow this, this, uh, this path, the orange path and then the blue path up, what we have is pumping water from the Sea of Aqaba, from the Red Sea. We pump it upwards, we desalinate it, to provide water for new communities in the area. Desalination produces fresh water, and it also, you have to do something with the salt. It doesn't create blocks of salt. What it creates is very salty water. So we're going to take that very salty water, and we're going to keep it separate. We're not going to mix it back in. We can bring it to the Dead Sea, which won't mine the extra salt. The water continues, more desalination up towards the Dead Sea with water supply all the way up to Amman, Jordan, a city that really has significant water shortages. And as the brine um, and additional water heads into the Dead Sea, you get to make some electricity. The amount of energy required to essentially double the Jordan River flow and dramatically increase water availability for the people of this region is actually not that large. So putting all of this together, along with projected rail lines, other transportation connections, and if we think about the broader region, in, the, in a Belt and Road Initiative kind of framework, we see an area of the world that is a natural hub of connectivity. This is where continents come together. Europe, Asia, Africa. This is a fantastic location with sufficient water, with peaceful development, with transportation. This is a, an area that would, would truly be flourishing. I close with a short quote from Lyndon LaRouche. This is from 1979. He said, the only human thing is to give the lives and suffering of the dead meaning, not merely by establishing peace in the Middle East, 
but by establishing the basis for peace, which gives fulfillment to the lives of the present and future generations of Palestinian and other Arabs, and thus purpose and fulfillment to the sacred lives of the dead. This, of course, applies to the Israelis as well. Ask yourself, how does a future-oriented policy in which the shortage of water is addressed from an international perspective of regional and global development, how does this transform the political terrain? What kind of peace can be achieved? Dear participants, on the eve of the conference, the organizers publish a fragment of an interview with the founder of the International Schiller Institute, Ms. Helga Zepp LaRouche, as food for thoughts. We support the main message, which involves the implementation of the large-scale oasis plan to supply the region with water, including for irrigation needs. It is precisely such a large international infrastructure project that could serve as an incentive for the economics of Palestine, Yemen, Syria, and other countries. Its launch would definitely have a positive impact on providing young people with jobs, including qualified ones, on creating conditions for the return of refugees, and on the economic stability of the entire region. This is certainly a very attractive idea. The fight against poverty, which is so often talked in the UN system on the principle of economic, economic development. It is impossible to ensure the elimination of hunger if you offer only ready-to-eat food. You need to provide those in need with fishing rod. States should pay more attention to infrastructure projects, including international ones. The primary task at the moment is to ensure that the swords of iron are sheeted again as soon as possible. Of course, this doesn't stop us from thinking about new approaches to the long-term resolution of one of the most complex and confusing conflicts of our time. We are glad that such work is underway, including under the auspices of the Schiller Institute, and we are confident that it will be in demand after the start of this so far delayed but still inevitable fundamental transformations that will increasingly change both Palestinian and Israeli societies. Thank you for your attention. Uh, in the Middle East, you have always this idea that, of course, water can lead to uh, the war as it is quite scarce. But in the same time, water can be a possibility to bring peace because uh, everybody needs water. And uh, you have the case of international water, international aquifers, international rivers. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the main possibility to reach uh, to a global peace is to involve all the countries in a global plan. That's why the spirit of the Johnston uh, plan uh, at Eisenhower's uh, uh, era. And I, I think uh, we have to work, uh, the national community, on this uh, possibility. Because as former president uh, Shimon Peres from Israel said, uh, if we want uh, peace, uh, water won't be a problem. Okay, uh, so uh, in his opinion, uh, there is either enough water in some areas, and when you don't have enough water, you can um, imagine new solutions to have more water. And that's why, uh, and it is uh, on this uh, project, uh, Israel works and succeeds in the desalination water uh, and other countries in the Middle East. So now, we know that we have the technology, uh, we can strengthen this technology, of course, with uh, new energy sources and maybe nuclear energy, a civilian nuclear energy. And so that's why I, I'm still optimistic, maybe in 
not uh, in the coming years, maybe in five years, ten years, but there are many technical possibilities now uh, to go to peace uh, with water. Thank you very much. Over many centuries, if there's one subject that has transcended political conflict, it's been science. Scientists have continued to talk to each other during times of conflict. That is terribly important. We also have to look at something else now, and that is that there's a direct correlation between the GDP of a country and its electricity consumption. There's a rather well-known graph in economics that shows an absolute direct correlation. There's a straight line. No countries do not fall on this line or near to the line. If you want to double the income of a person, you have to double the electricity consumption of the country. End of story. Nobody makes money without electricity. It is the lifeblood of a country. It's the lifeblood that keeps everything going. Just as much as if your heart stops beating, your body immediately starts to stop, and your liver and your stomach and your everything doesn't work. If electricity stops in a country, the country winds down. The water consumption of the planet is going to double, and then it's going to double again. But Mother Nature is not going to produce any more water. So water becomes an electricity issue or an energy issue. We're going to have to move the water around a lot more. So we need much more desalination. We need much more pumping, canals, and all sorts of scientific methods of shifting this water around. We heard the previous speaker now speak very eloquently about the situation of the water distribution in that Middle East region. Uh, some have got more than others and so on. What we've got to do is take more water out of the ocean, desalinate it, get it onto the land and shift it around and recycle it. So this becomes a technological issue. So we need to have much more of a system Society in which there are rules and which there is structure. We cannot allow this extreme green left wing to come along and do as much damage as they are. We've got to look towards doubling the electricity consumption, doubling the water consumption. And that means things like desalination on, on a large scale. We need to get the realistic people to be able to create these frameworks that we can, through technology, do the best for mankind. And I think it's all possible, but it's an intellectual challenge, and it's quite a, a challenge all around. But I'm sure it's possible to solve this with the right attitude. Thank you. So we need to learn the lessons that peace is a relationship that based on collaboration, partnership, and sharing together for one interest that leads to stability and sustainability. And most important, that this peace should be dynamic to match the needs, the updates, because life is not static, it's a changing. So we need this piece to work on it. So we need this, number one, to put an end to this genocide and to start serious negotiations based on the international resolutions to put an end to the occupation, to the atrocities, and most important, accountability, because we need accountability in our world. And parallel with that, to start the issue of economic development, which will be consistent with the stability and sustainability, believe me, this will spread hope among the people to see a change in their life. And that's the key for success of economic development based on ending the violence and the conflict, the occupation and the injustices. Having listened to the presentation from nine o'clock this morning, our time till now, I'm I'm just struck by the uh, notion of a uh, a group of people watching a burning building, and um, and people saying, "Well, let's let's put some water on this building. Let's let's start the fire hoses." Uh, and one group is saying, "Well, maybe we ought to find the people who started the fire, and make them put the water on the building." Um, but I think, from our perspective, um, this uh, technique scientists and engineers were more interested in having um getting the fire put out first and um we can deal with the other things later um and i'm firmly of the belief that um uh, an economic solution technical and economic solution can be the basis of a political solution where it's often very difficult <clears throat> to uh come to a political solution 
in 19, in 2015, uh, our company uh, did a water study for the Kingdom of Jordan. And um, during that study, I came, I was at, I got into uh, uh, conflict with the uh, agency that was sponsoring it because um, they were trying to find out ways that we, we, they expected us to find ways to keep the people from getting the water that they needed in order to limiting the demand to what the supply was. And I kept arguing, no, 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 what we really need to do is we need to increase the supply to provide Jordan with the water that they need in order to have an advanced society. You cannot enforce people into a permanent state of um, of um, deficit, right? Shortages. It, it just doesn't work. There's several advantages that Jordan has in, in solving the Middle East problem. One, it, it, it has access to uh, the Red Sea here at Aqaba. And uh, what we had proposed, and the, 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 there was been discussion about the Red Dead project, which is using basically build large canals and using gravity to flow water into the Dead Sea and then to generate electricity. Uh, that is my understanding has reached kind of an impasse because of problems with the amount of water going into the Red Sea and effects that would have on the ecology of the Red Sea. But what we were taught, what, what, what our concept was that you would bring, um, uh, there are companies that will make nuclear reactors on barges. One is uh, a company called Thorcon, and there's Copenhagen um, uh, Atomics. And you can bring these modular reactors in by barge in up the Red Sea and establish an, uh, a, um, a site in, in Aqaba where you would where you would desalinate water and generate electricity. And uh, the brine from that water would be returned back to the Red Sea or put out into evaporation basins, whatever. Uh, and then you would there's a it's a 300 um a 300 kilometer pipeline between Aqaba and Amman. And uh, then basics, but you you would start by by developing water and power around Aqaba and then let the system spread to the north as more and more water, land became uh, irrigable. And, uh, there was more production. There was uh, inexpensive electricity. Um, and you will let the system pay for itself as, as it developed. Uh, Jordan to us is the one of the last refuges of the Middle East. Uh, it has absorbed a lot of refugees from Palestine, uh, Iraq, and Syria. The population now is over close to twice that was planned because of the influx of refugees. Uh, the water supplies cannot keep up with this. Uh, power supplies are horribly inadequate either. And Jordan has no oil or gas. It must basically import all of its fuels. So um, they make that makes them a prime... Um, candidate for this uh, for this project. The question that often comes up on the OASIS plan that I've heard from a lot of people is why are you proposing putting nuclear plants in the middle of a war zone? Are you crazy? How could you possibly get these things built? And uh, I think that the, uh, you know, the energy needs and also for the particular case of, of Jordan, as we just heard, which doesn't have the kind of hydrocarbon wealth that many other nations in the area have, uh, provide a provide a good good answer to that question about why a higher energy form isn't just better because of saving effort and resources and so forth it might indeed be necessary to get the project off the ground um, at all since south africa is a nation which has a nuclear power plant providing electricity can the knowledgeable presenter speak how this has benefited the economy of South Africa and its neighbors. The Kuburg nuclear power station, which is a 2000 megawatt power station, is 40 years old and is currently undergoing uh, a major refurbishment, which will set it right for another 40 years. It's currently producing South Africa's cheapest electricity by far, and it's very stable and very reliable and therefore easy to control as against wind and solar, which are very erratic and unpredictable and therefore very difficult to control. So the nuclear has been highly be beneficial. You see it particularly now that after running for 40 years very successfully, it continues to produce very cheap electricity. 
uh, we have South Africa produces and consumes about 50% of the electricity of the whole of the continent of Africa. There's a, a lot more electricity required in Africa. The countries nearby us that are something like 15% or maybe 20% electrified. So the only honorable thing they can do is double the electricity consumption and double it again, then double it again, then double it again. And when we get these extreme greeny do-gurus who come here and say, you must stop, stop expanding your electricity consumption, stop right now, which you've got to save the planet for your grandchildren. You say, hang on, why am I saving the planet for my grandchildren when my children are going to die now because you're blocking us from expanding our electricity consumption right now? At the point where we should wrap up the panel, um, I, I felt very motivated and encouraged by statements of uh, Ambassador Hassassian who said, The OASIS plan has a great uh, resonance globally, will be taken seriously. And also Ambassador Sisulu said that the OASIS plan will ignite a lot of interest. So I think this work is really, we have laid the foundation. So I would like to see there to be much more international technological discussion. How do we solve each other's technical problems on a wider front? Because they say the world is get, becoming a smaller place due to all the modern advances. And that's definitely the case. We see cell phone networks around the world and so on. So I would like to see much more uh, of the technology people being also politically aware and understanding what is necessary to stabilize society. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have troubles into the future. Jason, are you, well, do you want to say something? I, I, I want to at least begin to address the, the question that, that uh, William de Orio posed about where do we, you know, where do we go next? What, where do we do coming out of this? And, you know, there are, there's a lot of activity going on focused on this region of the world right now. There are a lot of people calling for ceasefire. There are a lot of people saying the fighting must end. There are a lot of people saying the humanitarian aid must come in. You know, I'll go on a flotilla if I have to. This kind of thing. I think that a measure of success will be in seeing more and more people saying, we need the OASIS plan. What are we doing fighting? This is the future of the region, especially because it also usefully challenges other axioms that people hold that they may believe are progressive or moving the uh, planet in a better direction and aren't. I mean, I think that this also directly confronts the green issue through its call for transforming nature, of changing the environment, which is a good thing if it's done in a good way and which we should not be afraid of doing out of concern for some endangered salamander or something like that. So those are a couple of, of, of thoughts. I think we've got to, got to popularize this and then find other fora for uh, holding discussions on this perspective and bringing more people into this to get a better idea of what the plan should look like and also just make sure that when discussions on this topic are occurring that this future orientation is injected because I think it, it just dramatically changes the political terrain and could make an otherwise impossible resolution a possible one. Thank you so much, gentlemen.